Greetings, fellow cucks, snowflakes, soy boys, and Antifa super soldiers, and welcome to I Don't Speak German, the podcast in which I get Daniel Harper, internet lefty person, and my friend and colleague, to tell me what he learned and heard during more than two years of listening to and reading what the alt-right, which is really the far right, say to each other in their safe spaces, their podcasts, their YouTube videos, etc. This is episode two. Last week, we talked about one of the uh, better known representatives of the so-called alt-right, Richard Spencer. And uh, we're actually recording this episode two on the anniversary of the day he got punched, I think. Um, but we need to. <laughs> yeah, I know. But we need to um, revisit uh richard spencer a little bit which in what might be sort of a regular feature of this show which is the the stuff that uh, we didn't get to talk about last time so uh daniel take it away what was it that you wanted to talk about richard spencer that uh, we didn't cover last time well i don't know if i really wanted to talk about richard spencer some more but uh, i did there, well, were, there were a couple of things i wanted to uh, just to, to bring up uh just uh things to highlight that i that i kind of missed in the uh, in the in just in last week's show um, wanted is you know a relative term <laughs> right i would there there are much better things that i could be doing with my time than uh following all these assholes and uh you know that's just how it goes uh, anyway um uh, the first thing you asked me about the uh the kind of the funding uh issues in terms of uh you know where richard spencer gets his money and where a lot of these guys get their money um one detail that i i did i do think i missed there was that um regnery publishing um, this is a, a sort of right-wing fringe, um, you know, book uh, publisher. Uh, they've published uh, basically anybody and everybody over uh, right-wing politics in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, it's uh, run by this guy, uh, William Regnery II, and uh, that uh, Regnery, the uh, William Regnery, actually started and funds the National Policy Institute and uh, kind of a uh, he self credits as like having quote unquote discovered Richard Spencer in you know 2011 or so um, oh, and kind well of giving him that so uh you know good for you uh, regnery um one of the issues is that uh richard spencer is kind of more overtly racist than uh a lot of uh, the other people that regnery publishes are comfortable with and so uh, there's some friction there but um you know it does seem like regnery is kind of right on board with that he is a billionaire um apparently and this is sort of the uh source of a lot of the you know richard spencer is secretly jewish stuff is that um i think regnery himself i think there are some family connections um between down the spencer line and down the regnery line and then there's a, a little bit of a um somebody is uh supposedly half jewish or something i forget all the details of that but um you know a lot of the um lines of you know richard spencer is an imposter you know seeking to bring down the movement stuff that you see uh in kind of the fringier weird corners uh do go through that kind of regnery link um anyway hmm. uh well another... that sounds reasonable yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the thing you will, if you do decide to join the white nationalist movement, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming that like half the audience is just going to be convinced they need to do that after every episode. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you do decide to join it, um, know that you will be accused of being a Jew by someone. That is, uh, it's just um, par for the course. Yeah, part of the, um, uh, the second thing I did want to mention uh, was kind of just the weirdest uh reference that i've kind of uh, you know one of the one of the things is sort of the uh the question of like how connected are these guys to you know sort of the the respectable types the suit and tie types to the more um you know violent uh you know kind of paramilitary groups um it's really difficult to kind of know with spencer um as far as i can tell i have seen no kind of direct connection anywhere um but there was this kind of one detail where after the MSU speech in, uh, I think, May 2018, um, there was a, uh, I think it was a Unicorn Riot leak. I was looking for the uh, for the reference for this, and I could not locate it. So I'll see if I can I can dig it up, and hopefully we can put it in the show notes. But um, there was a uh, an incident where uh, after that uh, after that speech, he goes back to this uh, kind of undisclosed location safe house somewhere in Michigan, um, somewhere in central Michigan, and uh, with a whole bunch of, um, you know, kids <laughs> goons um fellow white nationalist types and uh they were making molotov cocktails out of tiki torch fuel and empty bourbon bottles mm. and in different bourbon bottles presumably <laughs> yes <laughs> so we've got uh, our first podcast in joke sorry go on <laughs> uh it's uh the, the the issue there for me is you know it's it's hard to tell from the um from the description because it's just this kind of uh you know kind of very uh vague kind of leak again is uh you know were these kind of like just kids kind of larping as revolutionary types or was this was this uh actually a more like hard attempt to uh 
you know, defend themselves against the uh, oncoming Antifa hordes that they were sure were, were coming. Um, and that's, it's just one of those weird details, A, that they were, like, they were kids making Molotov cocktails, and Richard Spencer is just kind of, you know, again, in his suit and tie nationalism, uh, hanging out with all these people, and, you know, doesn't seem to have any problem with it. Um, <laughs> which uh, does kind of speak to some of what, what his day-to-day life is likely like. Um, but also, um, just uh, I find it, it's it's weirdly on brand that it was Tiki Torch Fuel, right? Yeah. <laughs> like it, it does feel like you know they're they're really I, I really feel bad for the Tiki Corporation. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's just one of those weird details. I thought it was just amusing and kind of scary, but in that kind of I don't really quite know how to place this way, but I thought it was worth bringing up. Um, and the uh, the third thing, and this is probably the the one thing that I really felt bad about missing, um, because I meant to mention it, and I was kind of like, um, I, I almost put it in a sentence, and then I kind of got distracted um, during the recording last week, um, is that he has been uh, very credibly accused of uh, domestic assault uh, against his uh, now ex-wife. Um, and, uh, in fact, this morning, as we're recording this, there was a, a piece in the Huffington Post um, where... Um, a reporter actually spoke to uh, both his ex-wife and actually spoke with Richard Spencer. And uh, based on what I'm seeing, uh, this does seem, you know, pretty legitimate. I mean, Spencer does not deny sort of emotionally abusing his ex-wife and some of the, I mean, there are like violent texts and that sort of thing, um, but does um, does overtly deny ever actually uh, hitting her. Um, but there's pretty clearly a giant mountain of rage inside him that uh, he keeps so well away from the cameras. And, uh, I, um, you know, I, I think the Huffington Post piece, I mean, there's a lot of criticism going on, as there always is about, um, it seems to uh, kind of let uh, his ex-wife off the hook a little bit too much, um, and that it um, kind of doesn't, uh, because she has been like, working with Spencer for, you know, the last, uh, you know, dozen, or last several years, uh, nine years or so, I think they got mm-hmm. married in 2010, um, or so eight years, but uh, there is a... Uh, and, uh, you know, his wife is, like, translated Alexander Dugan and, you know, was very involved in this movement uh, as much as uh, Spencer himself is. So, um, yeah, no, uh, there th- that is just kind of a detail that, again, I would have kind of kicked myself for not uh, bringing up at some point. Um, I didn't want uh, the listeners to feel like I was um, letting that slide or didn't care about that issue or, or whatever. Um, you know, that okay. was something that I just missed in the conversation, just forgot to kind of bring back up again specifically. Yeah, I'm sure, um, you know, there are lots of people uh, thinking now, you know, how can we criticize Richard Spencer for punching his Nazi wife if we think it's all right for people to punch him if he's a Nazi? Surely that's exactly the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, no. It's aren't, exactly, we, aren't we massive hypocrites now? Yeah, it's clearly, it's absolutely, you know, it's it's uh, just one for one, uh, exactly the same thing on both sides, you know. Yeah, like, A is A. It's, it's, <laughs> But are we quoting Ayn Rand or are we quoting uh, uh, Plato on that one? That's really the question. <laughs> that's that's too meaty for us. Okay, so um, having having dispensed with uh, with our unfinished business from last week, uh, this week we're going to go back in time a bit. Well, not really go back in time because unfortunately he's still around. Uh, and look at uh, one time Ku Klux Klan Grand Wizard David Duke. Uh, so Daniel, tell me about David Duke. Sure. Um, David Duke was uh, born in 1950 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, he moved around a lot. His uh, father was a petroleum engineer, uh, so he did uh, kind of move around a lot in his childhood. He briefly lived in the Netherlands when he was about three, um, before they eventually settled in New Orleans uh, in, I think, 1954 1955. Uh, he uh, describes he had a uh, an African-American housekeeper who he dearly, dearly loved as a child. <laughs> who was oh, well, uh, like a second mother he, to him. So He can't course, be a racist then. Obviously. He can't be a racist then at all. Uh, he describes uh, in his autobiography, which uh, we'll get to that, um, he does uh, have <laughs> lots of purple prose about, uh, you know, his uh, basically Andy Griffith-like uh, upbringing in uh, Louisiana. Um, in fact, he says, you know, as a child, we often uh, saw the Andy Griffith show and thought that just looked like our lives. Um other uh, people who have written about his past have uh, slightly different views about that. Um, 
Uh, apparently, he was often bullied and called Puke Duke, um, you know, for, for one detail. Uh, but so anyway, he uh, describes being uh, very uh, kind of liberal and uh, very open to racial integration. And like everyone around him in Louisiana in the late 50s and early 60s was clearly very uh, interested in, in moving forward on the race question and being progressive, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, he was assigned a school book report um, or a kind of a debate club kind of thing um, in 1963 when he was 13. Um, and uh, it was to uh, – he said, I would love to talk about segregation and I'm, because I am fully against it and I want to uh, discuss it. And that's what I want to do this project about. And his teacher you know, very cleverly said, well, no, I, because this is a, a rhetoric class, we're going to – you're going to have to take the other side, young man. And uh, – that's the only way you're going to be able to do this report. Oh, Duke says, I can't find any material anywhere about like this actually pro-segregation in um, New Orleans in 1963 um, until he <laughs> finds the uh, Citizens Council um, uh, building uh, downtown. And uh, they had not just one book, but a whole library of books. Uh, among these titles was uh, Race and Reason by Carlton and Putnam. Um, it's called uh, Race and Reason, colon, A Yankee View. And uh, basically, this book transformed David Duke's life. Uh, he becomes a committed white nationalist at the age of 13 based on uh, what – well, I think one day we'll – we may actually cover some of these books. Um, I have read this book. It is filled with the – you know, basically every, like, racist on Twitter uses some revamped version of the same kind of basic bullshit. Um, so he becomes a committed racist at the age of 13. Um, he meets uh, William Luther Pierce, who is the um, – a uh, guy who's best known for writing the Turner Diaries and who uh, kind of founded the National Alliance, a straight-up Nazi type uh, in 1967. Uh, this is a detail that um, Duke leaves out of his autobiography, interestingly enough. Uh, joins the Klan uh, at 17 in 1967, uh, goes on to uh, basically become a full-fledged Nazi in the, uh, as a college student in the uh, 70s, uh, from about 1970 to 1974. Um, graduates. Uh, he does spend a year in Laos with his father, um, which he does instead of uh, serving in Vietnam. He had attempted – he was uh, top in his class in the uh, ROTC but uh, could not uh, join the um, military to fight in Vietnam because of his um, uh, racism. I mean they, he was – even at that time, he was too well known to, uh, to be able to uh, actually join the, the military. Uh, so he goes off and has a, a long and distinguished career as a uh, basically professional racist. Um, the details of that, I mean, it kind of gets uh, kind of messy and contested. We can kind of go into some of that, but uh, you know, the high points are um, by 1978, he appears on like the Phil Donahue show. He does a ton of uh, stuff, basically mainstreaming the Klan, also Nazifying the Klan, um, which is kind of an interesting detail. Um, he uh, runs for office a few times. He actually serves a term in the Louisiana House of Representatives uh, between uh, 1988 and 1991. He runs as a, a Democrat uh, in the 1988 primary, uh, basically uh, on the I'm going to attack Jesse Jackson ticket. Um, fails utterly. <laughs> um, he uh, had previously worked on the uh, George Wallace campaign, and there's some contested history there about like he, there was an arrest and he claims one thing and – the authorities claim another, but uh, he did um, join the Populist Party, um, try to run in their primary uh, in the 88-89 era, and then uh, kind of becomes a Republican after that, um, and uh, has uh, run for president a few more times in 92-96, uh, and uh, in 2000 uh, attempted to uh, gain the uh, uh, Reform uh, Party nomination and kind of failed at that. And then I kind of came back to the Republicans, and uh, he had attempted to run, I believe, as governor of Louisiana in 2016. Um, most people know David Duke in that kind of like late 80s, early 90s period. Um, that's kind of the height of his um, uh, kind of era in the uh, kind of public eye. Um, but the reason I really wanted to do him second after Richard Spencer was because he – David Duke in like the late 70s and early 80s reminds me a lot more of sort of where Richard Spencer is now. Although David Duke was in his, you know, late twenties at that point, and Richard Spencer is, you know, forty years old. But um, at least sort of the sort of the the, the strategies and sort of the uh, the the connections that he's making. And so uh, I think Duke's later career gives us a, a sense of uh, where Richard Spencer might go um, in the next, you know, ten or fifteen or twenty years, um, assuming he remains active in the movement, which there's no reason to think he will leave it. Um, the other uh, big salient detail in uh, uh, David Duke's life. 
Um, after the year 2000, he does spend about five years living in Russia, um, feeding on uh, Russian right-wing um, media money. Uh, he goes to prison <laughs> from 2003 to 2005 uh, for um, tax fraud and mail fraud. He was uh, pretending to be uh, penniless to his uh, base of supporters, and uh, he... Um, Actually got uh, prosecuted for it, so he did. He did serve a prison term. Uh, he does. He does a have a, a doctorate, so he calls himself Doctor David Duke. It's a, basically a right wing racist diploma mill in the Ukraine that uh, awarded him that. Uh, published his um, book My Awakening, which is his um, autobiography in uh, 1998, and uh, another book, uh, you know, The uh, Jewish Roots of Communism, I think is the title, in uh, like 2002 or so. Um, oh, that sounds and, charming. Yeah, no, it's uh, and. Uh, Believe me, it's basically an expansion of a section of My Awakening. Um, and, uh, you know, if you – yeah, we're, we're definitely going to have to talk about My Awakening. Um, today he runs a uh, – he does have a radio show without an RSS feed, or I would, like, spend more time listening to it. Um, but uh, it's basically unlistenable. Uh, you know, we're podcast hosts. We kind of understand the uh, – the process of becoming a podcaster is often just kind of the process of, uh, you know, I feel like I have things to say, and, you know, certainly I'm not going to uh, pretend that, uh, you know, a, sort of a vainglorious uh, lack of um, uh, self-enjoyment to a certain degree. But d no man, I think, in history has loved the sound of his own voice more than David Duke. <laughs> he talks and talks and talks and talks. I listen to – he does a ton of, like, uh, particularly after 2016, uh, he does a ton of um, guest hosting on other people's uh, podcasts. And uh, he appeared on one show once where the uh, – some, you know, I think this was, like, uh, right before Charlottesville – right before right after Charlottesville. And uh, literally the kid, you know, asks him uh, one question. So, you know, how is it going, David Duke? You know, or welcome to the show, something of that nature. And mm -hmm. David Duke continued to speak for a full hour uninterrupted. <laughs> Well, uh, I hate to draw comparisons, but uh, Adolf Hitler was also famous for that. He used right. to just talk and talk and talk endlessly. He used to keep people up all night at the dinner table just talking at them, and then they'd, they'd all be allowed to go to bed when he finally finished at 3 a.m. Yeah, I, I, I can't imagine that uh, being with him uh, personally is anything uh, more than that. I mean, I, it's it, he, he, he sounds like an absolutely insufferable human being. Um, he is now 68 years old. Uh, he appears on these radio shows all the time. He is regularly a guest on uh, the public space, um, the public space, which is get JF Gary Eppie's uh, show, which we've uh, mentioned before. And uh, there is, I'm going to give you this link. There is a, a very cute uh, little three minute video of, uh, you know, David Duke saying like, "Hold on, let me uh, let me stop you for a second. I just need to uh, I need to get something out before you kind of move on to your point." And uh, then continues to speak for long enough that JF is clearly clearly made uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> um so uh even the uh, even the other uh, other people in the uh, white nationalist movement don't really like him too much um some of the uh, leaked uh unite the right planning documents like the text that they were receiving was uh it's so pretty clear that richard spencer was uh, planning on uh, ditching david duke after the rally and like not telling him the place of the after party was going to be and that sort of thing <laughs> um you mentioned that the era he's best known for with the public is the is the 80s and early 90s and uh, that's the era i i mean firstly the Don the famous donahue uh, uh, appearance was in uh, 92 wasn't it and yeah he actually appeared on donahue twice once in 92 and once in 78 um the 92 appearance includes um clips from the 78 appearance i cannot find uh, the full 1978 uh, interview anywhere online if somebody has that please uh let me know <laughs> Yep. Uh, and he became known in the 80s as kind of the uh, the new face of the clan, didn't he? Unless I've got this wrong. He was yeah, no, so, as the guy that was making the clan respectable, supposedly. Yeah, that's a little bit more in the 70s because he actually left the clan in 1980 and he found something called the National Association for the Advancement of White People. Oh, um, right. Guess where he got that name from? Uh, oh, yeah, that sounds familiar. Again, this is, again, a pattern that you uh, see over and over again. Even the term white power itself was a misappropriation of the black power rhetoric of the 60s yeah. and 70s. Well, um, I mean, you know, how, how can you object to it? How can you say there's something <laughs> wrong with white power if you if you don't think there's something wrong with black power? Because, again, you know, hey, ESA, it's the same thing, isn't it? All lives matter. You know, I yeah, mean, exactly. so, so David Duke was all lives mattering the uh, NAACP in uh, uh, 1978, uh, 1979. That kind it's of almost era. as if, you know, there's only so many ways you can package the same old bullshit almost almost yeah. 
<laughs> okay, so I got uh, my facts a bit wrong then. It's more the 70s when he was looked upon as the guy revamping the clan. Right, that's that's a little bit earlier, but um, it's funny. Like even the uh, even those kind of later appearances during the '80s would you know kind of refer to him as like ex Grand Wizard, you know, or even Grand Wizard of the KKK. But at that point, he had kind of ditched the robes in favor of uh, you know, the the suit and tie, and you know, he put on this very presentable appearance. And uh, you know, he's he's very well known for the uh, you know, in the mid to late '70s uh, up to about 1982, he did a ton of like radio interviews, um, you know, kind of actively, you know, kind of pushing the clan as sort of this um, new, you know, new and improved, you know, we're not the, uh, we're not the bad guys, we're not the kind of inbred yokels and, and hicks that, you know, the media tells you, you know, we're, we're just a, a, a civil rights organization interested in uh, the rights of white people. Um, he also, and again, this is something I kind of mentioned a second ago, he um, is kind of credited um in uh, this book, Blood and Politics by Leonard Zeskind. Uh, if there is one book on the white nationalist movement I would recommend, uh, it is that one. It is an amazing, amazing text. Uh, David Duke uh, features uh, heavily in it. Um, I was going to kind of reread like the sections of the book in preparation for this uh, uh, for this episode, and then realized very quickly that now like he's in like 300 pages of this thing. <laughs> um, and I it would basically have... just be rereading the book. So. It would basically be rereading the book, right? Um, but uh, he's got his fingers in a lot of pies, um, and he's he's a he's a really really important figure in that kind of in that kind of period. Um, and then kind of later on when he when he was reaching for a more mainstream uh, like political office. So I mean you kind of get these like kind of two separate like eras of david duke one of which is kind of working with the clan in terms of um doing kind of more uh straightforwardly classic kind of white nationalist organizing like kind of building a membership list and that sort of thing um working directly with the clan and other organizations um some campus politics and that sort of thing and then um kind of later on when he becomes a, a you know quote-unquote mainstream political candidate when he's actually trying to achieve uh ordinary political office um and so those are the kind of two separate like kind of moments that that we kind of remember david duke for um and uh he often is sort of uh they, they get um they get confused i think sometimes in terms of like kind of people uh kind of think they're it's all kind of the same thing but no there's kind of a clan period and then there's kind of a later like seeking you know trying to become governor of louisiana trying to uh seek the presidency um trying to run for the uh the senate i think he tried to run for the senate yeah he he ran for a bunch of offices and, and kind of got nowhere he yeah, his uh, his biggest uh, claim to fame, uh, definitely in terms of his electoral career, was uh, he did run for governor of Louisiana in 1991. Um, he uh, was repudiated by his own party. Uh, he was uh, too toxic even for the uh, Republicans at that time. Uh, but it did come down to a uh, definitely closer than expected vote. Um, he ends up with, uh, again, according to Wikipedia, he ends up about 38.8% um, of the total uh, Yeah vote um, but he did win over half of the white vote in louisiana in that year which is uh, kind of terrifying right <laughs> yeah well that's the uh, incident in which i ran into david duke in my researches into uh you know uh libertarians and uh murray rothbard and everything because murray rothbard wrote a thing about that where he he uh, he says oh everybody's scandalized that david duke did so well in that election, you know, and then he goes on to basically defend him and say, well, you know, there's very little in David Duke's ideology that's uh, that runs counter to libertarianism, you know. Right. I mean, you know, the because uh, Duke uh, definitely was kind of uh, running under a sort of, um, you know, would 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 couch it as, you know, kind of white civil rights is sort of like anti affirmative action, anti, yeah. uh, uh, you know, kind of civil rights laws like, you know, freedom of association laws, states rights, that sort of thing. And uh, that plays directly into uh, sort of that libertarian ethos. You see a lot of the um, political organizing around that time in particular and the kind of like particularly going into sort of the more uh, kind of the libertarian, libertarian, Republican politics of the 90s rests on that same kind of uh, that same kind of language that same kind of logic so uh yeah no uh david duke was was seen as well we don't necessarily want to be quite that racist but uh we definitely support his right to be racist yeah um you, you mentioned nazifying the kkk perhaps you could speak about that a bit sure um this is uh, again is something that uh, is covered in a lot more detail in blood and politics um but the the basic idea is that the uh, the, the clan uh, was always sort of an anti-African American organization in sort of its early days. Um, mm -hmm. You know, from the uh, in the 1860s and then in the 1920s, uh, they were uh, they kind of didn't like Jews in the 20s, but they were um, much more. Uh, that was just kind of down their list of complaints, right? 
It was um, a side issue for them. Yeah. It was a side issue. And yeah. uh, what they were looking to do was to engage in sort of a more um, kind of white supremacist vision in which, you know, African-Americans kind of lived under the same government as uh, white people but were um, – uh, subjugated, you know, Jim Crow laws, um, segregated housing, you know, it was like, you know, we, we still want them to be laborers, we just want them to be away in their own little, like, crappy places. Um, and we don't want them voting, we don't want them having political power. Um, when um, Duke kind of takes over the clan, when he starts, uh, you know, just, you know, Nazifying it, um, he's looking much more in terms of sort of the, the modern, you know, the more modern idea of this kind of ethnostate concept of we want to, um, you know, have a government separate from Africa. I mean, you know, we don't want them near us. We don't want the crime. We don't want the, you know, et cetera. Um, and so it looks a lot more like sort of an, an eliminationist and uh, uh, much more of an eliminationist rather than segregationist party, right? Mm. And, of course, the idea of the, the ethnostate as opposed to the the segregationist version of, of the same racism is uh, very integral to racism today, isn't it? Right. Um, in fact, uh, you know, when they, <laughs> the modern day guys, you know, will, will uh, say, well, I'm not a white supremacist. They'll say white supremist as a uh, sort of a mocking, you know, white supremist. Yeah, I'm not a white supremist. You oh, just want to call me a white supremist, right? Um, because they're like, no, I don't want to live with black people. I want them to live in their own place away from me. You know, <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't believe I, I should be supreme. I, I want separation. And so uh, that rhetoric ends up being um, used a lot. I mean, of course, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a different version of the same thing, ultimately. Yeah, exactly, because um, the justification for Jim Crow was separate but equal, wasn't it? It was right. It's just the, it's just the same principle extended, and then they pretend it's a completely different thing. Right. Um, we we should probably mention actually for context that we're recording this just uh, uh, I think a couple of days after Representative Steve King uh, asked what why it was offensive now to call yourself a white supremacist. Yeah, well, come on, you know why why what could possibly why can anybody possibly think is wrong with saying you know I like I think white people are supreme you know it's like uh, it's it's white people we're we're just people with sour cream on us and, and uh, tomatoes. <laughs> Okay, Sorry, so, terrible joke there. <laughs> I apologize for that one. There's, yeah, there's only so much you can do for humor. Um. <laughs> well, here's a, here's a funny detail that I uh, skipped over there. Uh, during the sort of fallow period uh, in between when he was uh, kind of openly uh, kind of doing like open Nazi shit uh, versus clan shit versus political stuff, um, he also had trouble making money. And uh, one of the things he did, uh, he, he wrote a bunch of stuff under pseudonyms. And uh, he did write a book um, called Finders Keepers in 1976, uh, which is um, – and I'm going to take I, – I cannot find a copy of this book. I would love to read it. Um, <laughs> the book contained I'm, – I'm taking this from a Washington Post article from 1990, so uh, I'll give you the link to this. Uh, the book contained instructions on oral sex, foreplay, and vaginal exercises. It also encouraged women to have sex with married men because they make better lovers. Duke has said he not only checked for grammatical <clears> – <throat> Duke has said he only checked for grammatical errors in the sexual content of the book, but did not write those chapters. Uh, apparently, like the uh, the the bulk of that was just lifted wholesale from like Cosmopolitan magazine and those kinds of places. And he's literally he's literally just plagiarizing Cosmo and uh, writing a book and like using that to make money. Um, Duke is also uh, an inveterate womanizer. Um, he was uh, very well known in the uh, kind of clan circles in the in the seventies, and I presumably you know up to. I, I, I'm hoping not present day, but uh, uh, it was. You, you see a lot of people in kind of like uh, in in the clan groups who uh, say, you know, keep 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 your wife away from him. You know, he's a uh, he's somebody who uh, gets handsy well, and yeah. he's uh, perfectly happy to, to uh, cheat on his wife with uh, whatever pretty young thing um, is uh, hanging around uh, with the clan guys in the 70s. Mm. Well, you know, definitely keep your wife from him and away from him and keep yourself away from him and just keep away from him basically for, <laughs> for various reasons, let alone the ones just stated. Um, he, uh, he did marry uh, Chloe Harden uh, in the, uh, in the seventies, uh, Chloe Harden. Uh, they eventually divorced uh, and the details of the, uh, the courtship are uh, well covered in my awakening. Uh, why she left is not so much, uh, but the, uh, she, she does uh, eventually leave him and then she uh, marries uh, Don Black who uh, would go on to uh, found Stormfront and uh, also has his own little shitty radio show with our, without an RSS feed. Um, Don Black is a truly despicable piece of shit uh, who uh, <laughs> went to prison for a few years for uh, trying to uh, take over the island of Dominica in the uh, Caribbean. 
uh, and uh, basically kind of an open imperialist uh, attempt to form a white nationalist state. Mm. Well, like a private act of imperialism. Right. Mm. Yeah, there's a there's a very good book I actually just read called Bring the War Home, uh, which uh, kind of goes into uh, sort uh-huh. of the uh, – uh, that's a Kathleen Billu uh, is the uh, woman who wrote that. Um, right. But it's a very good book uh, that goes into the uh, that kind of history, the uh, kind of history of the uh, kind of Vietnam veterans coming home and, uh, you know, how they get involved in, you know, white nationalist, white supremacist uh, clan groups uh, and that and, and, you know, sort of the ideological connections there. And that leads all the way up into uh, the Timothy McVeigh uh, Oklahoma City bombing in 1996. Um, and that's a really interesting book that got that put me thinking in some some different directions um about about that stuff which i'm still kind of figuring out um the way some of this fits in but um we don't have to cover that necessarily um david duke is mentioned a couple of times in the book um but he's definitely not the focus because he was um it's more people that he used to uh kind of hang out with uh went on to do other things um in fact you can um, often find that a bunch of David Duke's like second in commands end up being, um, you know, a they end up not liking him very much, and uh, b they end up uh, kind of going on to form other organizations. Um, Tom Metzger, who eventually is going to form a White Aryan Resistance, who is still alive, who produces, uh, believe it or not, audio CDs of white nationalist radio programs that you can subscribe to for twenty dollars a month. He will mail you audio CDs of himself talking. Um, which yeah, I'm I've, sure is incredibly effective uh, way of spreading of the message there. Yeah, um, he's also in um, Tom Metzger is also in the um, um, Louis Thoreau in the Nazis documentary. He's kind of a central yeah. figure in that. Yeah. Um, and I he appear he does occasional appearances on some of the you know kind of more fringy uh, white nationalist podcasts. And so I've heard him I've heard him speak a little bit. Um, and uh, you know Tom Metzger is a anyway. So Tom Metzger is one guy. Don Black is one guy. And uh, you know, a bunch of a bunch of people have peripheral connection to uh, David Duke's uh, work in the 70s, who went on to do uh, more overtly violent things than David Duke did. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Also, he's uh, well known for like embezzling money from his uh, from the people around him, and there's some evidence he probably informed on some of his uh, unblings to the FBI. What I find fascinating is just how much of a clown he is today, and, uh, you know, because I describe all this, like, Nazifying the Klan, like, you know, let's make the Klan worse. You know, let's take the thing yeah. that was already terrorizing people and find a way to make it worse. David Duke does that. Um, you know, people know him as kind of this, uh, you know, pretty, you know, bright, whip smart person, you know, with, with uh, you know, kind of, you know, white nationalist leanings. He does a lot of the, you know, you see a lot of the coverage of David Duke in the 70s and 80s looks a lot like, you know, the way people, you know, the, the dapper young Nazi, you know, Richard Spencer stuff. Um, and so there's this kind of clear link there. I mean, a lot of these uh, kind of more current guys are clearly trying to kind of figure out where Duke went wrong, but kind of, um, you know, engage in the same kind of uh, mainstreaming of, uh, you know, these kind of far-right, you know, openly genocidal ideas into, uh, you know, kind of open political uh, discourse. Um, in the uh, in 1970, when he was a college student, he was uh, well-known for having uh, actual, like, Nazi posters on his uh, wall in his dorm room. Uh, a bunch of his roommates, you know, people who were there at the time will kind of attest to that. Um, and he used to uh, kind of go around campus wearing an SS uniform complete with swastika armband. Um, and there are uh, there's a, there are some photos, widely circulated photos, of uh, him in 1970 uh, protesting uh, the appearance, um, you know, protesting the, uh, the Chicago 7, who are the um, protesters who were arrested at the uh, 1968 Democratic uh, Convention. Um, he is uh, protesting the appearance of uh, one of their advocates in 1970 when he appeared at the uh, university at uh, Louisiana State, where uh, Duke was a student at the time. And, um, you know, again, David Duke wearing, wearing Nazi shit, being straight up Nazi. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, he, he, that's, again, something he does not mention in his, uh, in his autobiography. Um, he also, in the um, late 70s, uh, 1978, when he was um, kind of uh, part of the Klan, he did a bunch of, uh, you know, kind of public attention stunts, one of which was he uh, did a, uh, the, the Klan border patrol, uh, where he actually went down to the uh, U.S.-Mexico border and um, was, basically did sort of a, like a militia-like stunt to, uh, you know, to stop the illegal immigration kind of coming in. Um, and seeing that repeated oh. again is just lovely, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. Yeah, it's always nice to see these old standards come back, isn't it? As they <laughs> as they have done. 
So, I mean, he's this legitimately scary figure. I mean, he's this legitimately nasty little piece of work. But I, I think the thing that the, the the thing that amuses me is just how unseriously most of the kind of modern guys take him. Like they'll they'll kind of you know think, oh, he he did great work back in the day. He's you know, but but nobody wants to hang out with him. In particular, he's a, a huge fan of health food <laughs> and fasting. Um, he spends a ton of time talking about. Uh, uh, you know how I, in fact this hour-long thing i told you about in that podcast episode was really not about like how terrible the jews are although he will tell you how terrible he thinks the jews are at, at a moment's provocation although he'll usually say things like instead of like um you know jewish he'll say like the zio media he's uh, he's big into that you know the zio left the zio media you know um you know they're coming after uh, white people but uh, he uh, basically describes his fasting routine and his exercise routine, and he's like, you know, if you want to be, you know, you're a young guy, and if you want to be uh, whip smart, and you really want to, you know, be the best you could be, you really got to start, you really got to try fasting. And I've got this uh, health food in my in my bag here, and you should definitely try some of that. Apparently, in like the van in Charlottesville when they were uh, driving around as part of the Unite the Right rally, um, he he did he did give a, a small speech. It is online. I'll give you the. Uh, the audio of that, he and um, someone who we will definitely be talking about in the future, Mike Enoch, uh, did. A, there's like one video where they each give like a five minute speech, but um, apparently he was like pushing health food on people in the uh, in the <laughs> van on uh, in, in Charlottesville, and uh, you know so so in the like post Charlottesville in the post um, Unite the Right uh, podcast, you'll hear uh kids who were kind of there who like guest on the shows and they will uh mock david duke specifically for that you know <laughs> yeah because he's like you know you gotta eat pea soup and you know bran muffins and you know fast fast every day and yes it's uh it's complete complete nonsense but that's that's what he's into now he's basically like natural news but you know with like a racial agenda <laughs> Well, there's a lot of that in this subculture in various forms. There's a there's a lot of obsession with uh, you know diet and health foods and healthy living and supplements and stuff like that. To to vary, I mean, a lot of it's hucksterism, but uh, right. Well, uh, even in sort of like you know alt light circles, I mean, you know the brain yeah. force plus, uh, brain force plus, and you know all the all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, there is this um, one of the things that you know sort of this like uh, biological view of humanity is that you know that we are essentially our bodies that we are you know that that you know society and social you know socialization and you know like uh, those kind of things don't count it's all just biology and so they get really obsessed with uh, you know making sure that they're eating the right things and making sure that they're um, kind of uh, behaving properly as as men you know so they 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 work out constantly or at least they they say they work out constantly uh <laughs> that stuff that stuff happens a lot you you get a lot of like talk about you know how you're supposed to eat and what you're not supposed to eat and oh there are phytoestrogens in beer and you can't have beer although but like beer is a european thing it's like a european tradition we is yeah white isn't that one of the great absorb, achievements of you know can, european can, culture we can absorb alcohol where the other races just don't do as well, particularly, you know, Native Americans <laughs> and East Asians. And, you know, it's oh, because of our unique genetic heritage, which leads to a culture which allows us to absorb alcohol responsibly. And then the other half is like, yeah, but it's got photoestrogens and it's going to be turn you into a soy boy f cuck or whatever, you know. Apologies for the language there. Do you want to talk about his appearance on Donahue? Is that is there is that worth talking about, or have we covered that enough already? I mean, I, it's definitely worth watching if you're uh, kind of interested in um, kind of seeing what the uh, previous media environment is like, and in particular, kind of looking at the old. I mean, it's it's uh, I find him you know, at the time. You know, you look at that appearance, and you kind of look at the way that Donahue does and what Donahue does and doesn't challenge. You know, because yeah. Donahue can't. Um, he, so David Duke, I mean, again, if you um, look at kind of what he's he's done, he he bases a lot of his justifications on this like very strong pseudoscientific kind of genetic you know argument, right? Um, and you know, sort of like the ideas of race and IQ, and then you know, sort of like you know, he 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 claims to have been like interested in biology from a very young age, and so you know, David David Duke will come out and say, you know, well, there are kind of clear IQ differences, and you know, this comes from you know this like unique generic genetic heritage or whatever, and um, you know, talk show hosts uh, and, and Donahue just he doesn't have the uh, he doesn't have the rhetorical ability to really kind of combat that directly. And no. so um, it ends up being like – it's kind of the source of that like facts not feels thing, right? Um, this is actually more um, – I can't remember if that kind of happens uh, – if, if David Duke actually gets him on that kind of argument in 92. Um, but in the um, 
he had uh, Donahue had an episode on uh, directly about Holocaust deniers, and uh, that comes up over and over and over again. Um, one of the things that I think it is, uh, this is kind of just kind of a general challenge of kind of dealing with this stuff is, you know, how do you kind of deal with the arguments that they're making? You know, because the whole point of, you know, being able to say, look, I've got all this genetic evidence, and I've got all this, you know, William Shockley, the inventor of the transistor and the Nobel Prize guy, and, uh, you know, James Watson. Today, they'll talk about James Watson. <laughs> Uh, you know, the yeah. discoverer of DNA believes that you know, black people are inferior. He's the he's the uh, Galileo of our time, and um, you know, responsible scientists do not want to uh, challenge that because they don't want to kind of give it airtime. But um, when they make these claims to people who don't know the science, they're very easily uh, tripped up because they've got like rhetorical moves planned in advance, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it's a real challenge in. Uh, you know, combating this stuff um, because they sound like they know what they're talking about, even when um, they're they're actually speaking like clear nonsense that anyone with the basic knowledge of genetics should be able to refute. But then they've got you know kind of these big names that they you know say oh agree with our side. You see this a lot in like the creationism, which I you know I think everybody listening to this knows that I used to kind of hang out in those circles and you know mm -hmm. battle the creationists. And, um, oh you see, yeah, I you mean, see those same kind of strategies over and over again. It's the same with anything. You go into a debate about, uh, you know, 9-11 with a truther. If you don't know anything about engineering and metallurgy and stuff, they'll beat you, despite the fact that they're talking complete rubbish. Right. And just by the fact that they can sound like they know what they're talking about. You exactly. Know, it's like, you know, I've, oh, well, you know, have you ever looked at the, uh, you know, these, these IQ data? Have you, have you ever looked at it and they can, uh, you know, they've, they've got the kind of jargon down enough to... Uh, to flim flam essentially, and that's uh, that's kind of the really dangerous form of pseudoscience uh, there. Mm -hmm. What do you, I mean, the interview is famous. What do you think the overall effect was? Did it did it make him more respectable or uh, with it's the public? Hard to, it's hard to know. I mean, certainly sort because of because he seems to um, he seems to be quite influential, despite the fact that almost everybody, including all the people on his own side, view him with contempt. Because he comes across well in these interviews, because he's polite, because he can distance himself from the sort of stereotype of the clan, I think he has an ability to sort of um, become the respectable face of this stuff in a way that right. a few other people do. And so, so um, just, you know, so so the Donahue interview itself, I mean, that was after his kind of failed run. That was That was kind of him on the downward slope in terms of, you know, sort of like any kind of mainstream respectability. Basically, he lost uh, enough uh, political races that uh, he started to look like a loser instead of a winner, you know, because uh, in the in kind of the early days, he looked like, oh, this upstart who can kind of come up and and uh, win uh, electoral victories, and, you know, it's going to be kind of the new face of, of uh, you know, the Republican Party in some ways. And by 92, I mean, I don't know that it necessarily was obvious at that time that he that was kind of his, his peak, um, but... Uh, Certainly, in retrospect, we can see that that you know he he really kind of he was never higher in uh, kind of public esteem or in uh, his his public face than he was uh, in November '91 when that election happened. Mm. But would you say then that the the main way in which he's been influential? I mean, you said earlier that uh, um, Richard Spencer reminds you a bit of David Duke at this period. Um, would you say that David Duke's main uh, influence then has been this idea of being polite and uh, dapper and seeming respectable etc as a way into uh, the mainstream no i i think i think there's a lot to that and i think that this uh, kind of gets into uh, something that you know if you've been following these guys at all kind of the modern um you know alt-right movement they're uh, they're they're obsessed with their optics quote-unquote optics um yeah. like uh, the uh uh, you know, the, the polo shirts and khakis, you know, the idea of like, you know, we're not going to dress like slobs. We're going to kind of be like, oh, we're just kind of middle class, working class guys, you know, kind of like the, you know, and kind of wearing like what you'd wear to work if you work in the tech industry, which most of these guys do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I uh, wonder what that says about the tech industry. <laughs> oh, that's a that's a that's a that, that's kind of an amazing question, honestly. But that's um, a whole other series. Of that's a whole other. Things. Yeah, no, that's a whole other. That's yeah. a whole other thing. But. But, uh, you know, th this idea of, like, you know, dressing it up and cleaning it up and, uh, you know, making it. And, and, I mean, ultimately, this is um, the reason that David Duke can do this is, is in some sense, because of these sort of larger uh, media, um, again, post-World War II, I mean, never really dealt with the, um, the reality of, like, what the United States is as a white supremacist nation. 
you yeah. know. We never really, uh, or in Western society in general, but I can speak specifically to the United States, you know, we um, just kind of pretended it wasn't true. Oh, no, we've always been multicultural, which we have always been a multicultural uh, melting pot here in the United States. We've always had people of many different races and many different uh, societies and cultures who, who all um, joined together. Um, you know, we, we, we can't pretend that that's not true. Um, but, you know, we have done that in this kind of like openly white supremacist way that uh, privileged uh, certain kinds of people over others. Well, and yeah, I, I was, was going to say, you know, it's just that American capitalism was built on some, you know, some of those people being owned and used as farm machinery, as Kurt Vonnegut <laughs> put it. Exactly. Um, the fact that, you know, the rhetorical technique then was to paint the, uh, you know, oh, you want to be, you know, sort of like, sophisticated and polite you want to be um like a better person and uh, embrace a sort of multi-racial you know like like reject open forms of racism and uh, anybody who is a racist it's got to be some you know inbred hillbilly from from alabama or mississippi which uh plays very much in terms of you know kind of the way that the kind of resentment of the american south um you know since the civil war really but particularly after world war ii and sort of the way that um, you know, people living in the South do have a legitimate resentment towards, you know, quote unquote, coastal elites who, you know, treat them as inbred <laughs> hillbillies, you know. Um, and this has, you know, both kind of an explicitly uh, racial and a just sort of a cultural Christian, you know, kind of, uh, you know, all of this kind of gets played into um, uh, there's a there's a big stew of this kind of stuff and different bits and bobs of it kind of pop up every now and then but there there is this kind of uh you know I grew up in the south I I know how how you know the attitude is I mean it's it's you know when people say like oh, the Confederate flag is about heritage not hate I mean now that there's a there's a lot of bullshit there but there are people in the south who you know kind of legitimately think like you know we were just rebelling against these like rich rich guys who treated us like shit you know from this other part of the country and you know we were trying to kind of go off and do our own thing and like they for, they they ignore that like the thing we were trying to do was you know in, engage in you know a continued system of like exploitative labor and where people get to own other people um over like explicitly racist lines etc you know but um mm. there is there is kind of something to that in terms of the psychology and um Someone like David Duke and Richard Spencer and sort of a lot of these guys on the on the alt right now have have um, basically play into this resentment that you know where you know if you live in this kind of rural area and maybe your life isn't going so well um, and you feel like you're looked down on by you know again coastal elites and you can put parentheses around that if you like. Um, then somebody like David Duke is saying, no, I'm speaking for your interest. I'm speaking for white interest. I'm speaking for, you know, the, the rural, uh, you know, the people who live in these flyover states in this flyover country um, who do not live in these kind of big cosmopolitan states, again, with or without parentheses, who um, have a le legitimate interest and that your interests are that you are white people. And I'm reaching out to you as white people. And this, again, you can take that kind of 92 appearance. You can take uh, the stuff that he was doing in the late 70s. It's sort of mainstreaming, like making it nice and polite. And you can play that right into, I mean, we could we could do a supercut of like, you know, uh, David Duke in 1978, David Duke in 1992, Richard Spencer in 20, uh, 2009 or 2010, uh, right up into kind of the, the modern guys today. You know, you know we, could, we could do a supercut of like essentially one sentence. It just runs all through that. And it's that same basic idea. And that plays into, um, you know, everything that's been going on in American politics since the Southern strategy, at least. Um, yeah. This idea, you know, I mean, Nixon talking about, you know, oh, it's these uh, New York elites. I mean, in, privately he would say Jews, but, you know, um, you know, the idea that the liberal media is out to get you because you're conservative, because you're traditionalist and, you know, this great silent majority rhetoric. I mean, it's, it, it, we do get to this kind of thing of like it, it feels difficult to kind of take someone like David Duke seriously because ultimately he is this kind of very marginal figure and even at his like greatest success he was you know not really um, reaching that high he never really got that far in terms of like mainstream political success and now he does a really shitty radio show without even an RSS feed so you know it tells you like he's not a mainstream figure but um, he exists as sort of the tip of the spear that um, is playing with basically harder harder edged versions of what's going on in very very mainstream politicians of like both political parties uh, in yeah. particular in certain yeah. regions i mean this is in no way i'm no way trying to pretend that this is like a just a republican thing it's just it's just making explicit what is implicit 
you know, mm. and that's what I find kind of fascinating in a lot of ways about studying these guys is that the whole thing that they're trying to do is to say, you know, stop saying, um, you know, working class Americans and just say white people like you, <laughs> which is what you really mean. So, um, yeah, you wanted to talk about his autobiography. Yes, um, there is. I and I have given uh, Jack the links here, so there is a. Um, you can buy it on Amazon if you if you like. Um, Please don't. I'm not do going to stop you, but don't. <laughs> uh, there is a there is a PDF available. Um, it is on the Internet Archive. It is Googleable, but again, I'll, I'll give uh, Jack the link so you can have that. Um, I do have that PDF. I did uh, kind of go over uh, that PDF. I kind of skimmed a bunch of it while I was uh, preparing for this podcast. But my initial. Um, experience of reading this book was not through the PDF or through the text copy, um, which I would not buy a text copy. I'm not giving this guy any money. He makes an audiobook freely available on his website um, through the Internet Archive. He doesn't actually host the files himself, of course, because that's probably beyond his technical sophistication. Um, but he um, does a link to the Internet Archive. You can go and download an audio version that he recorded. Um, it's unclear to me when he recorded this. Uh, but it was sometime after 98 and before 2016 when he was running for governor. I mean, um, he does – so he not only reads the book, but he uh, goes into and he does asides on the book. So, for instance, he'll do a uh, like a sequence talking about like uh, date, then current data and sort of the, ra the race and IQ stuff. Uh, he'll, he'll quote like Russian from 1997. And they go – and then he'll do an aside and say something like, and actually this was updated in 2004. There was an even better book that was – and then kind of go into uh, that kind of nonsense. Uh, so he's not even really reading the book as much as uh, kind of meta-commenting on the book. Uh, there are tables in the book, and he will uh, just describe the table and say, and if you uh, download the PDF, you can uh, have that table and look at that uh it is truly insufferable it is i think 42 <laughs> hours long um i listened to it at 2.0 speed um i may give jack some audio from this i was looking for like a really choice package um let me describe the contents of this book to you um it's it's split into four uh, basic uh um um uh, units for four parts of the book and each one has several chapters inside um <laughs> part one is uh, essentially david duke's childhood where he describes uh how wonderful growing up in louisiana was and uh you know the andy griffith stuff and then how he discovered uh the race question and segregation all right so part two is uh <laughs> Basically, uh, race and IQ, uh, fraudulent pseudoscientific data. Um, and so there's a lot of David Duke saying things like, you know, uh, blacks are more inherently in inclined to crime. And we know this because of, you know, FBI crime data of such and such a thing. And I'm going to give you a citation. And again, if you want all the real data, I've got hundreds of references and you can find it in the paper copy of my book, which you can buy at such and such. Part three is on the Jewish question, which is essentially a long list of people that David Duke thinks are bad who are also Jewish. <laughs> I wish I was exaggerating this. That that reminds me of uh, uh, um, Nick Griffin's pamphlet about how the the Jews control the media in Britain, and it's basically just a list of people in British show business who are Jewish. You know, no, you just goes, oh, Vanessa so, Feltz and you know, like that. It's, that's basically it. No, it, it, it literally in in some places is like, oh, look at all the people in like uh, you know Lincoln's cabinet who. Uh, were uh, who had you know possible Jewish ancestry. Look at all the people in, uh, you know, and uh, I guess the book was written in like uh, the Clinton administration. So he goes through and like lists all the Jews who are uh, running such and such uh, department. Look at all the media Jews. Look at uh, and it literally is just a list. It's just like a whole bunch of it is just you know. And so to be oh and so and so and so and so Jewish, and then uh, this guy, his vice president, also Jewish. Um, it's it's you know the text version is bad enough, but listening to him just like keep the way he says Jewish over and over and over again. And the, like, like every time it's like supposed to be like this stab in the face towards his like rhetorical enemies is just, uh, it's, it's absolutely, um, you know, if it wasn't like filled with, uh, you know, the worst kind of anti-Semitic hate, it would be uh, really amusing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's just, it's, it's completely on the face of it. Ridiculous to basically just name a list of uh, Jewish people that, that you think I mean, it's just, it's, it's such, it's not even like a correlation causation error, like the sort of the race and IQ stuff and a lot of the like pseudoscience around genetics is. It's literally just look at some Jewish bad people and they're overrepresented because of such and such and such and such. And, you know, the Jewish roots of communism, Karl Marx, Jew. 
uh, you know, to, um, uh, um, oh God, again, just uh, it's 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 literally just like parts of it are just a list of like all the Jewish people who founded communism in uh, this in the in Russia in 1917 and you know that sort so of it's thing. So it's so it's literally you know, just uh, just that. You the know, hatred all, is the so Russian visceral. mafia is. The Russian mafia is really the Jewish mafia, don't you know? Because all of these people coming over and committing crimes and doing the uh, the Russian mafia stuff, they're not Russians. They're not real ethnic Russians. They're Jews. And that's that's what makes them extra bad, and they've got you know, weird sexual proclivities and that sort of thing. It's it's oh god, um, hours and hours and hours and hours of listening to him just you know um, do this. It was uh, I mean I tuned out for for uh, big chunks of it because it's just there's no reason to follow the details of this in any, in any it, detail it, it doesn't sound like a page turner um no um and then uh the, the fourth part i'll just kind of uh, finish up the uh just the, the description of the book is uh you know look at all the times i owned the liberals and the media um and look at all the like little edgelord activities i engaged in when i was a college student i mean there's a lot of like you know the and then i asked my professor well if you think that uh you know the, the egalitarian principles are right then uh how do you account for such and such uh and uh they had no answer because clearly i was right and they were just par- parroting their egalitarian bullshit um there's it's it's it literally is that it's look at all the times i owned the libs when i was in college and then when i uh you know, traveled the world. Um, I went to India, and everything was dirty, and I their their food is so spicy because they don't wash their plates. And uh, then I went to Europe, and everything was gorgeous. And uh, yeah, um, this is not an, uh, this yeah, is, this, we is, don't... this is a rich kid. He he got to travel the world. His dad was a petroleum engineer in the in the seventies. It's uh, um, we don't very have that in Europe. Um, another another rich kid, like Spencer. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, I mean, I don't get the sense that he's come kind of from old money the way that Spencer is, but um, you know, th- these kids are very, are very often um pretty well off. You know, there there's not a sense of uh you know real um you know kind of a material uh material lot, lack in their lives in in most cases. Um, I will say there is a uh, one detail that I you know the only thing I'm gonna like empathize with him a little bit here is that uh, his mother does appear to have been a, a really really awful alcoholic and a pill popper um, particularly after um his uh his aunt and uncle died when he was uh, very young and that kind of like pushed his his mother into this like really really awful alcoholism like every source agrees yeah this was really really bad um and so uh i will say you know what? Yes, David Duke, you had a really terrible experience with your mother. That doesn't justify genocidal racism, but I'll give him. I will give him that. <laughs> mm. Okay. So uh, the other thing about David Duke is that um, he was at Unite the Right in Charlottesville, wasn't he? He was, and in fact, uh, the as fact you've already that, mentioned, the fact that David Duke agreed to go um, when uh, I guess Jason Kessler, who organized Unite the Right, uh, asked him. Uh, the fact that David Duke agreed to go uh, seems to have, have been um, essentially the reason that Richard Spencer said yes, for instance. Uh, because, again, we have text messages of uh, Kessler texting with uh, Spencer. And he said, you know, Duke and Duke and Enoch are both going to be there. And Spencer, like, agrees, okay, yes, I will come then, you know. Um, and so David Duke kind of does lend a certain, like, legitimacy to Unite the Right on the, uh, on the far right at that time. Just because, like, oh, we've actually got this, uh, you know, this white nationalism 1.0 is kind of what they call it we've got these uh this you know kind of um giant figure who's very well known in the movement who's taking us seriously um david duke appeared on the uh the fash the nation podcast in uh, 2016 for instance and it was really weird for me because i had been listening to that podcast for a couple of months and then hear david duke come on and then using words like cuck it was just like what the fuck are we doing <laughs> like you know david it's you know like like when your grandpa starts you know trying to you know trying to play hip-hop or something it felt uh, like a really uh, strange thing to me at that time um, well was- this this sort of image of the facebook grandpa has kind of been recurring to me a lot during the during our conversation this time. sure no there there's a lot of that there's a lot of that going on to where david duke is uh, i mean they they sort of respect him in the sense of like he's just kind of been around forever and they sort of like give him a certain amount of space but again they don't seem to really like him they don't think he really gets their memes and uh he's kind of, i mean again he's kind of a joke <laughs> you know he's just 
<laughs> you know, he's kind of the doddering old grandpa, and uh, there there are some figures who seem to have like kind of legitimate affection for him, but um, I think everybody kind of finds him insufferable, and uh, they think that he's gonna uh, try to steal their wives, and he's gonna try to steal their money, <laughs> so. And wants to talk to them about health food. Yeah, about about health food and the Jews. That's all. It's just the Jews all the time. Everything. The Zio media is out to get us, you know. I really should give you some audio and, and just to, just to drop in at some point, just so I, I think that people should listen to like thirty seconds of this guy talk uh, at some point. Pinky was my family's black housekeeper, who seemed like part of our family. She cared for me as if as if I were her own son, prepared many of my meals, tended my wounds, and listened to my dreams. I was eleven years old when she died, and thinking about her now warmed my heart. So how did it happen that despite my childhood love for Pinky, I became a spokesman today for what the postcard sender had called, quote, the politically incorrect European American? As my life and thoughts unfold in this book, you will find out why. I will lay bare the formative parts of my life, the experiences that stand out in my memories, and recount the search for truth that led to my awakening. In telling my story, I will challenge the vital premises of the establishment and roast some sacred cows. I will anger those who worship fashion rather than independent thought. Hopefully, a few of the more open-minded will pause to think. In this book, I offer an eye-opening view of the world today, a revolutionary view to be sure. I also offer my evolutionary vision of the new world that will be created tomorrow. Yeah, so uh, probably the uh, the only other thing I would I would mention is uh, that uh, since we, we mentioned uh, Richard Spencer's uh, disastrous uh, personal relationships and uh, you know violent uh, activities, we should talk about uh, there is a there is a piece um, I've mentioned Chloe Harden who uh, he married in the 70s, but uh, we do have a uh, a little uh, a little bit from a woman who did date David Duke in the 1999-2000 uh, era. Um, it's actually a woman named Lori Eden, who is a uh, kind of former swimsuit model, um, who uh, I think was in her uh, 40s at the time, and uh, dated David Duke. Um, there is a, uh, a really nice little profile where uh, she kind of describes the process of, uh, of dating him and uh, the fact that uh, she thinks a lot of this uh, kind of racism is put on. Uh, or at least she did at the time. I haven't seen any kind of more recent stuff. I had to try to Google around. I mean, she is still alive. She is still um, kind of living her life. Um, as far as I know, she doesn't like talk about this stuff ever um, anymore. Um, there were some uh, kind of like Facebook posts by her where she just kind of said, I don't talk about that anymore. So I, I'm perfectly happy to let her have, have the rest of her life to not have to deal with it anymore. But um, at the time in this uh, interview, she apparently uh, feels that uh, the Duke is putting on some of this. Um, she tells the story of, um, you know, one of his kids was uh, playing in a pool where a black kid was, you know, on the other side of the pool, like, playing. And David Duke was fine with it until, like, one of his flunkies shows up. And uh, then he's like, no, we have to protect um, – what, what did you do? Let her be in the pool. We've got to keep her away from those monkeys. Um, that sort of activity, uh, meaning that you know he, he's maybe not quite as explicitly racist as he pretends to be um, for his buddies. Um, I say you don't spend 50 years in the uh, white supremacy movement and not like actually believe this stuff. Um, but uh, yeah. that's that's her perspective. Um, but it is it is just sort of a, a it's. I think it's uh, more likely you know suddenly there was somebody there that he wanted to impress. Right, right. You know. Um, Sorry, I'm rereading this profile. She was 33 at the time that she and Duke dated exclusively and said that Duke's racism seemed to depend on having an audience. Once hanging around with his entourage, big men who had shot people before, men who would take care of him, he very publicly yanked her out of a large hotel swimming pool when a black child got in the other end. Mm. Um, but another time, at a small ice cream shop with Eden for her son's birthday, he got into a long and apparently friendly conversation with a black friend of hers. His followers weren't there at that time. Um, it It's... You know, there's a, there's a lot of talk about like how of like humanizing these people, right? And um, you know, what's the you know that the giving them any kind of ability to be like people at all is to like downplay the evil to some degree. Mm -hmm. And I I think it's important to note that these are human beings and to understand them as human beings as opposed to uh, 
treat them as um, monsters all the time. I think that treating them as monsters who are just fundamentally different from you and I um, avoids the, the the real issue. It avoids um, the fact that this is that this is uh, you know that these ideologies do not just come about because people are just like always bad, and it plays into the very thing that allows someone like David Duke, who comes across as well, he's very polite to to that one black person he knows, and therefore how could he possibly be racist? You know, it's um, that exact um, failure of knowledge and imagination that allows these people places to grow. And so yeah. I think that getting a sense of like who he is as a person, um, even through you know kind of an ex girlfriend who I think has her own issues with, you know, what she's uh, willing to say and believe about him, um, does give us a it does give us a peek into um, seeing him as a person as opposed to as a villain gives us a a sense of uh, the reality that seeing him as kind of the cartoon cut out of of just you know racist man bad uh does not and i think that we can acknowledge the evil and acknowledge the real harm that this man has done over his life uh while at the same time uh recognize that 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 those failures are human ones and not uh demonic you know yeah well it's always better to understand things properly and the more you understand the better it is always 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 and uh you know as you say if you think of these people as monsters the minute they turned up in a the, the minute they turn up in a smart suit and they're polite to you and they speak reasonably then you know you, you suddenly oh well maybe they're not so bad after all uh whereas of course they are it's the, it's the it's being able to understand that they are humans that allows you to understand exactly how they are so terrible um because if you if you if you indulge in this sort of fantasy of these people as just uh, just evil, you're uh, you know you're you're uh, I was I was going to say you're doing what they do. You're not even remotely, but you are hobbling your own ability to understand them, which is never good. Right, and and I feel like a lot of the the and also if you under, if you understand them as humans, and you can understand how pathetic they are. I mean, right. this is a like, this is a pathetic individual you're describing. He's obviously <laughs> a raging narcissist. Nobody writes an autobiography that takes 42 hours to read out loud, which he then does and record it and put it, you know, unless they've got serious problems with, you know, complete lack of self-awareness and, and self-knowledge. And as I say, raging narcissistic personality disorder or something like that. It's uh, there's something seriously wrong with this person. Right. It's kind and, of and, if they and, if they if they if he hadn't devoted his life to spreading uh, racism, it would be pitiful. I you know a lot of these guys feel like uh, like I mean you can imagine like David Duke the um, the used car salesman you know the guy who owns a, a car dealership who's uh, well they you know, are aren't is... they they're, yeah they're just hucksters they're selling bullshit and it's just <laughs> yeah, a different kind of bullshit to a used car. You you got to get that true coat. Or else, uh, you know, it's gonna uh, rust. The underneath's gonna rust, and that's the and, and that's the that's the whole thing. I mean, that's it. Just so many of these guys feel that way. I mean, uh, Donald Trump seems very much that way to me. Like, if he had mm. not been able to inherit uh, seven hundred million dollars over over the course of his life from his father, you know, that's a guy who would you know like own a car dealership somewhere, and he would be very very good at that, and he would not be president of the United States. And um, understanding understanding the personalities. Is and I feel like that's so much of what I just try to do is to just try to understand who these people really are as opposed to sort of the the version of themselves that they put out there and trying yeah. to understand that through the you know through the misty lens of their propaganda is a is difficult but also uh, I think I think you can get real insights just from just you know again just knowing that he spent 42 hours <laughs> reading this thing while he was traveling into a microphone um you know it is it's just it's ridiculous it's silly i mean look at his website i gave you the links to his website like go check the website where he uh, posts his, his uh radio show it it looks like it has not been updated since 1997 in terms <laughs> of its style um a bunch of these old school guys have have that kind of problem where it just it looks old and junky and nasty and there is just like it's just your racist grandpa it's just he's the he's just the king of the racist grandpas you know <laughs> like it's and that's a perfect place to end i think as long as uh, as long as you're you're happy to leave I'm, it there i'm perfectly happy to leave it there yes um, okay that's that's great thank you uh, again another great episode do you know what you want to do next time i uh i think we'll do unite the right next time um, right again just kind of feed into uh 
you know, something we sort of covered a little bit. We'll, we'll kind of talk about Unite the Right and um, some of the um, issues that sort of uh, how that came about and what that meant and sort of the before and after because uh, I feel like a lot of people have sort of uh, asked. I think I think people think we should do that one soon, and I was going to put it off for a while, but I think I think it, I think it's worth talking about now because I think uh, so many of the uh, things that we are going to talk about have a have a sort of pivot point uh, around the Unite the Right rally. So. I think it's worth going ahead and, and getting out of the way. Okay. Uh, then our next episode will be about Unite the Right. I don't know. I have a feeling that might that one might run long, so we might split that into two episodes, but we'll see. Okay, so thanks for listening, everybody, and thanks for Daniel for being so informative again. And that was the second episode of I Don't Speak German. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>